So jumping right in, um, I'm going to start with the definition of community engaged research, uh, which is defined by the CDC as the process of working collaboratively with groups of people who are affiliated by geographic proximity, special interests, or similar situations with respect to issues affecting their well being. So in our field, which we're trying to develop programs or products, we often use this definition of people with similar situations to obtain stakeholder input. So for example, we may be talking to patients who are experiencing similar experiences, similar symptoms or similar conditions, or we might be talking to caregiver groups to get inputs. And by engaging community, we aim to start our research where the people are by hearing about their current situations, their experiences, and what they perceive as needed. So there are different levels at which we can engage community in research. So this figure shows a continuum ranging from no community involvement to the far right side of community driven or community led projects. The lowest level of engagement, of course, is no community involvement, where communities simply not involved and researchers are working independently of the community based on their intuition or their knowledge. Moving towards the right, uh, in some cases, uh, researchers may use some types of information like data from community to inform their research aims and strategies, which is called community informed research. However, at this level, communities still not usually aware that the research is even happening in their community. At a slightly higher level of engagement, researchers may consult the community by asking for input and feedback to inform the research. And when community has some active roles in the research, such as providing feedback in town hall meetings or guiding the direction of the research, community is said to be participating in research. Yet higher level of engagement occurs when community initiates research by approaching the academic partners like us with an issue or program that they want to focus on or they want to solve, and the researchers respond to such needs and help them out. The second to highest level of engagement, as we can see, is community-based participatory research, also called CBPR, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, in CBPR, community and researchers have equal share decision-making power and ownership of the project. And finally, at the highest level, we have community-driven or community-led projects where community leads and owns the research with expertise support from researchers like us to just support their efforts. So this figure shows the same levels of engagement, but now focuses on community's perspectives as well as the researchers' um, perspectives on engagement. For example, community's perspective range from we do not know about this project to the mid-range of researchers provided opportunity to participate to um, the highest level we fully own our research. On the researcher's side, it ranges from we had not contacted the community to the community is in charge of this research and we're supporting their effort. Uh, for those of us who conduct community-engaged research, this framework is very helpful in assessing where we are currently, what kind of level of engagement we are having, and help us really think about where, where we want to go moving forward um, to, towards the higher uh, level of community engagement. Now, I have multiple community-engaged research, and each one engages communities at uh, different levels, um, and it really depends on where the project is, where the program development or product development processes are. And as I mentioned earlier, community-based participatory research or CBPR is one of the most well-recognized and used methods of engaging community in research. Uh, it is defined as a partnership approach to research that equitably involves community members, organizational representatives, and researchers and others in all aspects of research processes. Um, I want to quickly introduce some of the 10 principles of community collaboration from the CDPR because these concepts are often used to guide community engaged research, even if you are not involved in community at the level uh, where CDPR project may do so. Uh, for example, we seek community's input to benefit from community's knowledge and expertise on the topic we are studying. Uh, we also try to promote co-learning as both community and researchers can benefit from collaborations. And to do so effectively, we make sure that community members and researchers have the equal say on our project. Additional concepts include emphasis on ecological perspectives. We're thinking about different levels of influence on uh, each issue that we form. 
uh, importance of cyclical and iterative processes and disseminating findings and results back to the community. Um, and this dissemination is very important as it can generate new questions from the community as well as us, the researchers that need to be addressed and um, just the iterative process of our research. And this figure just shows the iterative and spherical processes that we take where community informs our research and research again informs back, provide information back to the community to identify areas that can be further addressed and we can con continue on on this um, processes to continue to improve the community. So now I want to talk about a couple of different projects in which I engage community stakeholders. Uh, this first one is called Disaster Purpose. Um, this is um, this program is developed to help all adults prepare for disasters. Um, and we had a series of projects um, to go under this project um, because um, and all of the series of projects were informed by stakeholders um, at each step. As a quick background, older adults are vulnerable in disaster situations and younger adults, for example, I think Katrina, 41% of the batteries had at least one chronic condition that required medication. However, most people evacuated without their medications. As a result, 74% of this occurred among people 60 and older. Most of these cases due to the quick health decline weeks after the initial impact of hurricane. And disruptions in medical and social services after disasters also cause quick decline in health among older adults. Um, just the FEMA emphasizes the importance of facilitating preparedness among older adults. National data shows that older adults are less prepared than young adults, with less than 25% indicating that they had any plans for emergency situations. The typical preparedness interventions or programs look like this. And those are usually brochures or educational materials telling older adults what to do to become prepared, and they are published by agencies like FEMA or Red Cross. So when we present those to older adults, um, older adults quickly identify barriers of becoming prepared, such as preparedness steps being complicated and expensive. And they also point out that their functional and physical limitations prevents them from becoming prepared and the overall lack of um, social support to become prepared that's available. To address this issue, we conducted some research. Um, so I'm going to go into the first one. So the first project focused on developing a theory-based disaster preparedness program specifically for older adults through stakeholder engagement. Uh, we also obtained feedback from the stakeholders um, in, to, in terms of how we can best implement this kind of program in our community. But here's the process we took. We started out with um, tested programs that was originally developed for families of children with developmental disabilities and medical families. We then conducted a comprehensive review of the resources uh, from governmental agencies and nonprofit organizations. We extracted pieces for information that were very important to older adults in disaster preparedness. We used them to devise the program to create the version one of the disaster preparedness. We then showed this version to providers who gave our services and programs to older adults in our community, like case managers and news only drivers or administrators from service provider agencies to get feedback and recommendations. We incorporated their um, recommendations to develop version two, which we took it to all our adult residents in our community who also reviewed the programs that provided feedback and recommendations. We conducted in-depth interviews with those older adults um, to identify additional topics that need to be addressed, for example, like obtaining support during and after the disasters, avoiding becoming a victim of scam or preparing their pets. Um, after incorporating their suggestions, we took the final version to pilot test through a series of focus group uh, interviews um, and um, also the pre and post survey before and after they participated in the program. And results of our pilot study shows that the theoretical basis of program really worked. And for example, program, program was designed to motivate older adults to become prepared by increasing their perception of susceptibility that they could encounter disasters and self-efficacy or their belief that they can become prepared and response efficacy, it's a belief that being prepared can lead to better outcomes. 
And so participants in our program indeed reported an increased level of perceived susceptibility, self-efficacy, and response to efficacy that in turn led to changes in their behaviors, um, like becoming prepared. And some older adults may now got the tools that they needed to become prepared, or some of them shared their emergency management plans with their family and neighbors um, to make sure that they had a strong support network system. Another theory we used was uh, the social network and social support theory. So we specifically have in this program where we enhance social support system of the participants. And um, so as you can see, all our adult participants would identify individuals who they can rely on to help them during and after the disasters. And so they identify those um, individuals and indicate who's going to be helping with what. For example, preparation, evacuation, providing shelter, helping with healthcare or transportation. And we ask those older adults to go and share this plan with those support networks that members that they identified to get a confirmation that they can indeed help them in case of the disasters. Uh, we also conducted focus groups with program participants to identify implementation strategies. And in these groups, older adults told us the importance of having this uh, disaster management plan, the personalized emergency management plan as an electronic version. They wanted a PDF of the, uh, their plan so that they could share with their family or their case managers. Um, as for the implementation strategies, participants also suggested that they wanted to work with those service providers, like their social workers or case managers, so that these individuals can help them develop this electronic version of the disaster management plan. So they were very clear about, we want electronic version, it should be online. However, we're not gonna be touching the computer. We need someone else to do it for us or with us to develop our plans. And so we took that suggestion and took it to the next grant and received that grant uh, with the stakeholder advisory board. Uh, as our community partner uh, to implement this implementation research. And so the goal of the next research was to develop the electronic tool um, and also to develop the implementation strategies with the stakeholder advisory board. Um, so this research uh, was funded um, and we had proposed uh, five different steps of community engagement. So step one was to establish stakeholder advisory board and jointly develop operating procedures. Step two was to, with the SAD, uh, stakeholder advisory board, conduct community assessment. Step three was to develop a disaster prep as electronic tool with the SAD. Um, and step four, developing step, uh, prep-wise implementation protocols in collaboration with the SAD members. And finally, step five was to pilot test on the implementation as well as the impact of the program. So the first step was to establish the SAD and decide on our pro operating procedures. Uh, for example, as you will see, we discussed members' preferences on meeting locations, frequencies of the lengths of the meetings, and ways to communicate with us, the research team, and whether they wanted to have formal MOU established with the university or not. Uh, for example, um, the, in this meeting, SAB suggested that we rotate meeting locations amongst organizations that can host the meetings so that someone is not constantly driving a long distance to get to the meetings. And um, by rotating the location, we could distribute that burden, driving burden. And it's especially important in rural areas where people might be driving longer distance to get to those meetings. Uh, not all stakeholder advisory board asked for formal MOU. In this case, um, organizations asked us to send them an informal letter indicating their participation in this project so that they could show it to their boards or uh, whoever that might be that they needed to um, inform about their participation. And this is the initial sub member. Um, as you can see, we had an order that representative. We always have order that representative on our stakeholder advisory board, as well as representatives from various community based organizations or public agencies like emergency management agency, local public health departments, community action agencies. Once the SAD was established, we worked to, uh, with them to conduct community assessments so that we can identify who else in the community may benefit from our program, who can potentially outreach to the data of the program, and so on. We wanted to identify who's doing what in our community in terms of disaster management. 
This project was also funded as a separate uh, research project um, in which I have proposed to conduct a social network analysis of the two um, community-based disaster management coalitions, as you can see on the slide, Lynn County and Johnson County, which are adjacent to each other. Lynn County is to the north and Johnson County is to the south. Mm -hmm. so, and out of those 55 organizations that belong to these two coalitions, 41 organizations participate. Uh, most of the participating organizations were non-profits, um, some are governmental agencies. Those organizations all together actually identified 105 organizations that they collaborate with in disaster management. So it really showed us a larger picture of this disaster management network in our area, which was really helpful moving forward in identifying our partners. Uh, by conducting network analysis, we could see things like um, what each organization did. Um, so as you can see, um, the circles are organizations and minds are collaborations. So you can see there are many, many organizations in, involved in disaster planning and disaster response. But when it comes to things like um, providing co-sponsoring educational programs or supporting World Adult, you can see that there are many, much fewer organizations involved and fewer minds, fewer collaborations happening between the organizations. Um, we did take the results back um, with um, the indicator of organization, so they could see who's where in that network system and provided several recommendations back to the coalitions on how they can move forward to better support their community. And one of the recommendations that we made was that because all those organizations, all the same organizations, already collaborating in other areas, the planning and response, and um, there's room for improvement to collaborate more in other areas like supporting the adults or co-sponsoring educational and programs um, to enhance the preparedness of the community. We also asked about organizational representatives perceptions about the vulnerability of older residents in their community. And the representative generally felt we use the same theory. So we asked about perceptions of susceptibility, self-efficacy, and response efficacy. Um, so those reps um, generally felt that all the residents in the community are very susceptible and consequences can be very severe if they encounter disaster situations. They also felt that the outcome can be improved uh, if the residents were prepared. However, they really didn't feel like all the adults could um, get prepared on their own without any support. Many respondents also shared with us that their organizations have been talking about ways to better support vulnerable populations, including older adults, but they really didn't know how to do that or they didn't have the tool to do so. Um, so this very confirmed uh, for us and my staff um, that our program may be very, very beneficial to these organizations if we can make this happen. So moving on to step three, we um, were also at the same time developing online tools with the SAD. Uh, we met very frequently, especially at the beginning of the tool development, almost monthly, um, as research team would present drafts of the web pages and sub members would just sit there, suggest changes in wording, color, layouts, sizes of the logo, sizes of the fonts, everything you know, we discussed about it. Um, we had many interesting conversations, have, um, members have very strong opinions on how the uh, tool should look. Um, we, uh, I, I believe we went through 10 or 12 different shades of blue to just come to this final version of the logos that was approved by NASA and to move forward. Um, Sub members also brought up things like um, in order for them to ask their staff or employees to use this program, and the interface of the data into needed to be much simpler and much easier to use. Um, so they had a lot of say. We, uh, our tech team tried to address those issues. Um, and it took us, um, we originally um, planned to spend four to six months on tool development, which took us more than a year to come to this final product. Um, but because of the community engaged processes, we were able to have a user friendly tool. Um, and when we all approach the organizations to use it, um, people are more willing to accept it because we had said that those organizations helped us to build this and we made sure that it was user friendly um, so that there was some um, credibility um, that we could add and by the involvement of the sub members. 
So there are five steps on this tool now. The original program actually had seven steps, but the sub members felt strongly that seven steps were too complicated. Nobody could remember seven steps. We had to reduce to five steps, so we did it somehow. Um, step one, uh, completes household assessment and evacuation and response needs. Step two, develops emergency support networks, as I discussed earlier. Step three, to correct information about documents. Uh, step four, to make medication and medical supply plans. And step five, to build two sets of emergency supply kits, one for take and go in your backpack, um, and one for stay at home and sheltering. We also have information pages for different types of disasters, um, helping people understand what they can be doing before, during, and after each type of the disaster. We also added special considerations topic, and all of those were suggested by the staff uh, in our meetings. For example, um, many older adults had friends who are caring for family member with dementia. So they really wanted us to have Alzheimer's and dementia section to help those families prepare for disasters with special needs. Service providers and requested that, oh, um, that we have a um, section to help older adults prepare for their pets. Um, so in 2018, we experienced a great, great flood of Iowa. A lot of people were evacuated. Um, in those cases, out of border adults refused to evacuate because they didn't have plans for their pets and they didn't know what to do with them and they were not going to leave those pets behind. So now we have a module um, to help um, older adults prepare for um, their pets emergency situations um, so that they know what they're doing if something happens. Uh, we also developed personalized disaster emergency plan report template um, with the help of the SAR so that the participants can share their electronic PDF version of the um, grant with family and their care providers. SAB also requested that we develop this community toolkit, which basically gives step-by-step -step guidance on how to implement the program and how to train their staff if they want to update the program in the organization. So moving forward to step four, um, Next step was to develop the implementation protocol. So we used worksheets like this. We had many of those worksheets um, to have discussions with staff to identify who can deliver, who can outreach, who can follow up, who can provide support to other adults to implement this program. Um, um, one of the implementation protocols that we developed involved one of our sub organizations in that not surprising. Um, and in this case, um, we had a social worker of that organization who wanted to get trained. Um, she goes around three different senior apartments as her job. She has offices in three different senior apartments. Um, so she wanted to get trained and she wanted to deliver the program to her clients at those buildings. And um, so we did exactly that. We trained her, we provided resources, we provided all the tools that she needed, um, and she went on and did the intervention. Um, so we were able to capture 30 households. Um, we did a similar kind of pilot test that I described above, um, and we had a very similar um, outcome with improvements in perceptions and improvements in good friends. And as always, uh, we went back to the community stakeholders and asked to provide feedback at the end. Um, and here are the questions that we received at that point. Um, so some of the questions that came up were, are the data security stored? Who has access to the data? Uh, we told our adults and our, our their case managers to have their plan. Can we use information to develop disaster response plans at community level? Can the program connect public health agencies, families, and friends? Can the data be shared between agencies that serve the same client? How can this program inform the inform and benefit statewide efforts to support those adults in disaster cases? And so these questions and motivate us to conduct another project. So we went and um, applied for another grant and started this next project, which um, Basically, um, we expanded our effort to state level um, to in order to answer some of those questions that were raised, especially about data sharing and whether the individual plans can be incorporated into state level efforts. So the aim was here um, to bring together the agencies that work in two separate sectors. Um, one was organizations involved in disaster management, and the other sector was the organizations that 
provide community-based services to older adults in the community. And by bringing together these two sectors, we hope to start the conversation on how we as a community can better support disaster diplomacy and management of older residents. Um, so as you can see in the picture, we met at the Fort County Emergency Management Agency, which is in Des Moines. We, uh, we had to travel a little bit to be near the center of our state um, in this case. And here's the list of the agencies that participated in that initial meeting. As you can see from the disaster management, we had a support of our homeland security, the state public health department, county emergency management, local public health um, department, as well as the nonprofits like United Way Red Cross. From the aging social services sector, we had Iowa Association and Area Agencies on Aging, as well as a couple of um, local area agencies on aging leading age um, aging services and also Iowa housing and urban development. First thing we learned through the panel was that public and non-profit organizations saw a great value in incorporating personal disaster management plans like disaster equipments into their larger community management efforts. Um, they also identified a number of policy barriers um, and potential ways to address them. The one big barrier that kept coming up was that most of the disaster management plans available are for disaster response and recovery, meaning that they have to be used um, only for rescuing people or recovering the community after the disasters happen. The funds to support the preparedness is very, very limited at this point. Um, they also talked about the importance of increasing awareness among the policymakers in order to secure ongoing funding to support the preparedness efforts in our state. Um, expert panel also highlighted that academic institutions like our university may be the neutral units that is trusted by all segments of the organizations, including all the adults in our community, that needed to continue to spearhead this initiative. So any of you who may have been in this type of situation when you put the state agencies and non-profit organizations together in the room, um, we had um, instances of some heated conversations going on throughout the day um, in terms of you know, who should be doing what and disaster management in the state and efforts and so on. And because we, I was leading that discussion, I was always in a neutral place. I was not taking anybody's side. Um, so they really appreciated uh, having a third party. So I think that's something that academic institutions like us can bring into this scene um, to um, facilitate the community um, actions and engagement. Um, they also pointed out that um, it is important for us to evaluate and document the strong evidence so that it can be used to convince lawmakers to allocate more funds to disaster preparedness. A specific recommendation they gave us was that they should partner with us. We should partner with them or the organizations that came to the meeting to collaboratively together develop the program implementation infrastructure in the state of Iowa. So we did exactly that. We went out and got another funding from the Canon Research Foundation. Um, to, in, to conduct this implementation finance, uh, first of all, and while we have to actually develop the online tool, um, we have to move the online tool to accessible locations because not all the organizations were able to access our tool. So now we have to move it to a better location. And aim two was in collaboration with stakeholder advisory board, we need to develop infrastructure to support disaster preparedness among all the adults in the state of Iowa. So our stakeholder advisory board has expanded to add volunteer services. This was another suggestion by our sub members um, because volunteer agencies were identified as necessary from our partnering organizations who tended to have limited capacity. So a lot of the service agencies wanted to train their staff and do as a program. However, when try, they tried to do that, they realized how limited their staff capacity was. Um, so by partnering with volunteer agencies and for us to train those volunteers and uh, separate from the organization um, and creating this referral structure um, so that agencies can um, call the volunteer agencies to have their volunteers come and do intervention program with their clients and really love that well. Um, so as a result of this expansion of SAB, uh, we actually established a very strong 
collaboration with AmeriCo crew done in the state of Iowa. So we even have a full-time AmeriCo member coordinating this entire program right now on campus um, right here today. This is a list of our current stakeholder advisory board members, which um, continues to expand every week, it seems like, but you can see Frontier Iowa, Iowa Community Action Associations being added to our stakeholder advisory board. And this is the overview of the program delivery infrastructure that we have developed um, through this infrastructure. Infrastructure or that adults can be recruited by aging service providers, um, like home health or senior housing or um, meals on wheels, um, and they get referred to us, um, which as a medical member coordinating the program. Then they would be connected, they will receive um, the username and account from us, and they would be receiving the program either by the service provider, their service providers, or the volunteer group. And at the end of the participation in disaster preference program, everybody is connected to our area, which is the statewide emergency management system, which actually links each participant to their own county emergency management services. Um, in some cases, they can register for their special needs registry and get um, personalized attention if the disaster happens in their area. We are formally evaluating our implementation based on the variation framework called UN. So we are focusing on assessing the reach, potential reach of our program, um, effectiveness of the program, adoption by the organizations, as well as adoption by other routes, implementation processes, um, and we are also assessing the extent to which this program may be maintained. We also have a new project that just started this past fall to focus specifically on family caregivers of older adults uh, who are experiencing Alzheimer's disease or newer teenagers. So we're now modifying our program to fit the needs of these family caregivers as individuals with dementia needs, um, specialized materials and specialized strategies um, to quit their home and evacuate and shelter at home after the disasters. So for this project, we are now um, we have now included caregiver representatives to our stakeholder advisory board as you might expect. Moving forward, it is likely that different versions of this program will be developed um, based on the needs of these specific populations. Um, we currently started to translate this program into Spanish, um, which is funded by the, our, one of our stakeholder advisory board members, Frontier Iowa. We are also starting a conversation with the state immigrant services offices. Um, about the possibility of adapting the program to various immigrant groups um, who were disproportionately affected by the recent derecho storm that we had in Iowa. Um, so this will require translation not only into different languages, um, but also to make sure that program is sensitive to the traumatic experience immigrant populations have experienced before coming to this country. And this will for sure in, um, require a stakeholder engagement because we do not have the experience. We don't know what needs to be addressed in this translation. So we will be having different types of stakeholder advisory board um, once we get to that point. So now um, I was going to talk about one other project um, called Remembering One, um, but I think I am going to um, go through, I think I'm gonna go through this very, very quick piece of that Nancy has enough time to talk about the AITC Stakeholder Advisory Council at the end. Um, but this program really focused on dissemination. Um, we used Remembering Grant Program, which was originally developed by CDC and National Fire Protection Agencies. The program is delivered by fire department personnel, uh, for example, firefighters or EMS. Uh, we had conducted evaluation of this program in earlier phases where we realized how much older adults enjoyed having fire department personnel come into their house and do the education. Um, if you are familiar with older adults in health promotion programs, it's nearly hard to get participation from older adults um, onto these health promotion programs. So what we wanted to do was to use this fire department program where everybody wanted their firefighters to come into it their house um, to connect um, as a gateway to connect those old adults to the traditional evidence-based force prevention programs that are offered in their community. And firefighters have very important roles in rural community, especially there. They are their heroes. And so we worked with rural communities to um, make this happen. 
here is a seven steps of community engagement that we took that are very similar to what I did before I explained uh, explain the idea. In this project, we started out with the state level stakeholder advisory board because we had connection with the state health department, um, state level host coalitions. This state level um, stakeholder advisory board members then helped us identify two communities, local, rural communities, where we can go to um, and potentially um, do this project. Um, once we identified two communities, we went into those communities, got to know people. We had some introduction from state level advisory board members and um, established local community advisory board. Now we don't call them CAB. Um, so each community had fire department, of course, because we need to have fire department, but we had local um, agencies that are in this and agent, agent, agent service providers, news on which YMCA provides post prevention program, county public health, and so on. Uh, from there, we worked with the local advisory board to assess community assets and challenges. I will go to some of the facilitators that are listed here and barriers for listed here. It's basically very difficult to recruit all adults. It's very difficult to recruit and train the trainers of the post prevention programs and also to retain them, especially in rural areas. It's very difficult to retain those people. And we, as you can see, created a very similar workflow um, where, you know, Organizations can reach out to the adults who then depart to fire department and then the fire department connects those participants to area agencies and agents where they help all the adults sign up for community based um, force prevention programs. Um, and then they kind of follow up, they help them um, figure out the transportation and they follow them to continue with their support. This is just an example of workflow we developed in collaboration with agencies, providing step-by-step -step guidance to staff from each collaboration agency so they know how to make this referral infrastructure work. And once the infrastructure was developed, we invited National Fire Protection Agency to do a training on the member and REM program. And we also conducted our own training to the staff of the agencies on how to implement the seed structure and how to use the electronic system that we had created for the referral system. The training activity really helped bring all these community members together and establish collaborations. Um, so in addition to fire department and police department, they invited libraries to come. And the non-traditional partners that we didn't even think about, but it turns out the library had space and the library had volunteers who wanted to do the program. So, it really helped increase the capacity of the communities. Um, here are some lessons learned, but I'm going to jump on to why we want to use community engaged research. Um, I want to conclude my portion by um, talking about those things. Um, we want to engage community stakeholders so that we can address the issues that are important to them that enhances the validity of our research. This approach also allows programs to be implemented by stakeholders who were involved in the development. So to stakeholders who also had a say in the process, the same has in program uptake. And this approach also allows us to evaluate our research outcomes in a way that really matters to the health and well-being of the population we are trying to serve. Um, and finally, because stakeholders were involved in the processes throughout, it helps maximize program sustainability, sustainability after our research funding ends. Um, we were able to enhance community capacity in these communities. And now we feel confident that communities will be able to carry on with their activities. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had a chance to talk to one of those community members um, after we had finished um, the Remembering Rain project and before that actually happened because of pandemic. But after the pandemic, we were able to um, touch base and learn that they um, kind of carried on with that project, even though we were not there physically um, to help facilitate. So they were telling us, if you want to pick it up again, we're here, we're still working. Um, so that was wonderful to hear. Uh, um, thank you for your attention for my portion of the uh, presentation. I want to acknowledge here some of the funders of our research projects that I have presented today. Um, and I am now going to turn this over to Nancy, who is going to talk about what is being done in terms of stakeholder engagement uh, to Johns Hopkins. 
Thank you, Sato, um, for such a rich and helpful discussion. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're kind of at the frontier of um, uh, the intersection of AI and aging research. So understandably, we don't have a lot of precedents or examples of how to engage older adult stakeholders in AI research, um, but I think there's a lot of commonalities and lessons we can learn from the examples that you have shared um, on how to engage older adult stakeholders in the community, um, even though the topic um, was different. And so a little bit about um, our uh, AITC Center, the Stakeholder Engagement Core is one of the seven key cores um, that make up the center. Um, Dr. Thomas Cujo and I co-direct the Stakeholder Engagement Core, and we really work uh, closely with all of the other um, cores together to advance our common mission, which is really to promote the health and well-being of older adults. And like Dr. Ishida said, to ensure that the work we do are aligned and informed by the real life needs and perspectives of those that um, you know we intend tend to, to use and benefit from, from these novel technologies. Um, if you can advance to the next slide. So one um, major initiative of our course so far is to compose of a stakeholder council. So similar to the advisory board that Sato mentioned for the example project that she um, was discussing and so here we focused on older adults, uh, caregivers, and frontline clinicians who take care of older adults, um, both those with dementia and without dementia, as those are the two um, uh, main focuses for our pilot grantees. And so we have uh, successfully recruited five um, older adults in the Maryland and DC area, including um, ones who have serious illnesses and, and are homebound. Um, we have five caregivers um, here in the Maryland and DC, including some of the um, ones in Eastern Shore where the access may be a bit different. And these include both caregivers for older adults with and without dementia. Um, we have uh, clinicians who work with older adults, physicians, as well as um, physical therapists, occupational therapists um, from both Maryland and Iowa. And we also have uh, community program coordinators from here in Iowa. And I would just highlight that um, a lot of our members really fall into multiple categories. So we have people who are older adults themselves and our caregivers. We have older adults uh, who, um, recently retired from being a clinician. We have caregivers who are also working in these community advocacy roles. And so really it's not um, that they fall into um, one group, but actually bring multiple useful perspectives. Um, we intended this council to really provide um, a longitudinal relationship with our center and core. And so each member has committed to at least a two to three year term um, and the thought is that really they would be our go-to for kind of large picture directional guidance and input. Um, and this way they will get um, a history and a foundation for understanding what our mission is. So it's not a new introduced concept each time. Um, Next slide just shows a little bit about what we have done so far. Um, we had our first meeting with the council members and our um, plans to have quarterly meetings. Um, we were very excited to have our stakeholders participate in the first national symposium for all the AITCs uh, last month. Um, we're currently um, actively trying to get their feedback for um, future RFAs um, to give input on what are the focus areas that we want to um, uh, future pilot grant um, applications to focus on. And we are in the plan of facilitating structured engagement with um, pilot grantees that's already been awarded. 
Uh, we're also conducting our in-depth uh, needs assessment with stakeholders beyond the council members um, and looking at the literature um, on current landscape and gaps, which I think um, resonate uh, a bit with some of the similar activities that Dr. Ishida also shared on her example. Um, and so that's just a brief overview of what we've done so far here at the AITC and our vision um, for, for moving forward, at least in the near future. Um, so I would love to open up for questions. Um, from anyone in the audience. Uh, I don't see anything yet um, in the Q&A. Um, so please um, feel free to, to jump in. In the meantime, I, I think one question I'll hmm. get us started with um, Dr. Sheeta is, um, you know, uh, people within the center or our pilot grantees or applicants may be new to stakeholder engagement and may not um, um, may feel overwhelmed by the in-depth um, level of engagement um, that you have illustrated. You know, what, what advice might you have for um, how to decide the, the level of engagement and, and how to get them started if they have never done something like this before? Yeah, I think it's, um, first of all, you know, recognition that stakeholder engagement can be really beneficial. Um, then using that continuum that I showed um, and kind of seeing what level you're currently engaging in. So it might be that I don't have any engagement right now. So you might be on the far left side of the continuum. Um, but um, and maybe seeing what the next level might be. Right. So we're not going to expect you to move from here to the far right and, you know, over a year even. Um, it takes like 10 years to get to that point. And so I think I think that's why I wanted to talk about the continuum so that you can see what the next level of engagement might be and how you might be able to get to that next step um, without like, skipping too many steps so that it's, it's not too overwhelming. Um, one question we have is um, how receptive are patients in rural areas to AI-based technologies? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so that's one thing that I have not conducting AI, conducted AI research, but I do have um, colleagues who use technology-based um, interventions, um, for example, telehealth um, or uh, telephone-based or video-based um, counseling for Alzheimer's caregivers. Um, and that is, I think the receptivity is depends uh, on the age, many times uh, age of the individuals uh, and caregivers. I think the bigger issue in the rural area is the connection. Uh, we are still fighting <laughs> with the internet connections and um, you would have to provide, you would have to get there, go there and help set up and provide the equipment. I believe the receptivity about AI or technology is increasing, um, especially the, the age of the caregivers are becoming younger these days. And I've been doing caregiver research for over 10 years and the ages and generations changing. And so I think the receptivity is improving, um, but there's still a lot of logistical issues that we have to figure out um, in our real areas. Yeah, so the next question kind of piggybacks well on that one, you know, can you elaborate on how the needs of older adults in rural areas are different than those in urban environments? So you mentioned on connectivity. So if we have a smart AI engineer listening right now, what, what would be, um, you know, the important thing for them to recognize as they develop new technologies? Hmm. So I was going to say that service availabilities are so different. Um, so, you know, rural areas, you, you have to drive far to get to your doctor's office. You have to drive far to get to your library to get onto computer in some cases. Or you have some participants who have to go to, you know, library to be able to interact with us. Um, so that's one thing. Um, so the needs are different in that area. Um, also, I feel like there might be, maybe it's going back to the receptivity. We also hear a lot about concerns of the security of the data. If you're transmitting some kind of information about technology, uh, what is this technology 
for what information is this technology correcting and who has you know access to that data? We do get those questions as well. Um, but I think those are the again, I would have to kind of refer to my colleagues who do after all um, you know, technology based um, programs. Um, and I can definitely get back on with you on that. Um, but those are the things that we have experienced. We we have um, our intervention is have. Wi-Fi hotspot to go and do an information because our program is you know, implemented using laptop and it has to have Wi-Fi. Um, so we do that, um, but we, we've had participants asking them being skeptical of that, are you transmitting this <laughs> um, So, so there's, there's still, um, you know, people, a lot of people are not used to using technology on a daily basis. Um, so there, there's, there's some skepticism um, Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. Um, any other questions from the from the audience? Um, I think maybe the concluding question um, I have is, um, you know, we have uh, people in the pilots are usually at different stages of their mm -hmm. development. Um, what advice might you have about kind of the timing of engagement? Sometimes, you know, when I say, well, I'm not ready to engage until I get to a certain step of development. Um, you know, I'm just curious on your perspective about that. Well, my experiences has been, especially, you know, not, maybe not the very initial one, but um, all of my research questions have been guided by the stakeholders, as you saw. Uh, we get feedback from stakeholders, they tell us what's very important, and then we go out and get a grant <laughs> to do what they suggest that we do. Um, so I... So, so the, the principle of community engagement research is that you want to be engaged in community at all levels of research, even before. So if you think about CDPR, community-based participatory research, you're supposed to engage community before you decide on the topic, because you go to the community and you discuss with the community what the issues are that they want to address, and you decide on the topic. Um, I didn't do that in my first study because I went to them and said, I want to work on disaster to can. So I came up with a topic and I went to the community. So that wasn't a true community engaged research uh, from certain people's standpoint. But, um, so I would say that at every level of research, there is a room for community stakeholders um, to um, contribute. Um, so it's a matter of thinking at, at this stage what information do I need from the end user or stakeholders and that eventually are going to be using this code product or program. Um, so, and I'd be happy to, you know, being a part of your community engagement core, I'd be happy to you know, discuss with anybody who is thinking about, but I'm not sure how to engage community to kind of differently brainstorm some ideas on that and you know, who might be a good stakeholder. Um, well, thank you so much. We're just about at the top of the hour. I want to thank you um, for for sharing your experience and expertise with us. And I want to thank all the attendants.